Welcome, welcome everyone. We are so, so excited for this presentation today. Linda is our superstar presenter, so we're very excited to have her and can't wait to get all of the information that we're going to get out of this presentation. We want to start off by saying thank you so, so much for jumping on. It is Clarity Fitness's first birthday today, which is the body positive gym that I'm sitting in right now. We're all about taking care of yourself as you are, getting motivated from a place of respect for your body and an appreciation for the skin that you're in instead of judgment or shame or guilt. And it's definitely a fun day. We're so happy to have Linda here to bring some birthday positivity to all of us, as well as address a massive topic that's so, so important amidst all things New Year's resolutions and New Year's ing. So we want to make sure that we're empowered with this and we want to make sure that we're asking the questions that are specific to what we feel will benefit our clients and our friends and ourselves and build from that. So again, thank you so much for jumping on. This is a super casual presentation, so feel free to unmute or turn on your video or whatever you feel like you need out of this presentation. You can leave your video off and kind of tune in like a podcast, or you can get as engaged as you so choose. Again, this is on behalf of Clarity Fitness. So we are Georgia's first body positive fitness facility in the heart of downtown Decatur, Georgia. We are being incredibly COVID conscious amidst all of these times. We've got tons of safety protocols and policies in place to make sure that all of our members and our team are safe and happy and healthy and just feeling their best. We also have a really cool platform if you're not local to the Decatur area called Clarity Online that you can find at online.clarityfitness.com. And that is a really awesome platform, half on-demand body positive fitness and half mental health. So if there are any mental health experts on the call today, we're also looking for potential speakers or potential group monitors or group hosts. So if you have a topic that you want to bring to a platform and not have to worry about marketing the platform and not have to worry about the upkeep of it, go ahead and email me at abby at claritifitness.com and we can get you all set up with some group coaching. And now for the fun stuff, I would like to introduce Linda Buchanan, who is an amazing author, as well as therapist, as well as human being, and we love her so much. She actually wrote a book about this topic. So she wrote a book called A Clinician's Guide to Pathological Ambivalence, which brings us to this presentation today, which is ambivalence, why can't I do what I set out to do? So she is going to spread some wisdom and share her brilliance now, and we'll give her a big virtual round of applause. Thanks, Linda. Thank you. Thanks, Abby. And um, happy birthday, Clarity. I am so very impressed with what you've done. I remember the first time I met you, and it was, it was something you were just working on, and you were talking about countertops and stuff, and now look where you are. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Great. And if people aren't really familiar with... Um, the philosophy of clarity, um, then I hope that you will go to their website and get familiar because it's amazing what she's doing. And um, I would like to say, I really love it if people's videos on, is on because I'm a real, um, I bounce off the energy in the room. And since we don't have any energy in the room, um, I can at least see your smile. So if you're comfortable, only of course, if you're comfortable and you um, aren't in your, I don't know, pajamas or something, although that doesn't matter either. <laughs> Hi, Georgia. Um, then I would, I would love it if you would use your video, but that's totally your choice. <laughs> so, and I also want you to, um, feel free to, uh, jump in, just unmute yourself. If you have a question or a comment, um, like Abby said, this will be, um, a pretty relaxed presentation. Although I do have a, um, PowerPoint, it's, um, uh, just sort of <laughs> hits my notes. So anyway, um, my first uh, thought is to ask you how you feel and you don't you you can respond or you don't have to but I just want you to ponder for a second how you feel about the idea new year new you new year new you so I tried to find a meme that sort of um, went against that idea and I couldn't find one so I actually took this photo off sh Shutterstock and enhanced it because I don't think that that's the way we need to approach the new year and I'll talk a lot more about that as we go through. Okay, so um, five reasons that New Year's resolutions fail. All right, I'm gonna talk about each one of these a little separately, but just to go for an overview, um, quitting, 
quitting as setbacks, clinging to the outcome too tightly, making unrealistic goals, which is similar to clinging to the outcome, using criticism to motivate yourself, and then my favorite topic, having ambivalence about change. And we're going to spend the most time on that, but we are going to talk a little bit about these other ones too. So the first one, um, quitting at setbacks. So I wrote a blog a little while ago, based on a blog I read actually, um, where the guy, the guy that I was reading said, um, fail, an atypical New Year's resolution, fail. Fail big, fail hard. And the idea is like these quotes suggest, anyone who's never made a mistake has never tried anything new. Failures are finger posts on the road to achievement. If you're not failing every now and then, it's a sign that you're not doing anything very innovative. We used to, I, used, I grew up water skiing and we used to tell people when we were teaching them to water ski, if you're not falling, you're not getting better. Um, so I've heard that ever since I was like 10. When we give ourselves permission to fail, uh oh, so let me see, I can't see the rest of that quote. Um, we at the same time give ourselves permission to excel. When you take risks, you learn there will be times when you succeed and there will be times when you fail and both are equally important. Failure is simply an opportunity to begin again, this time more intelligently. So if you've learned something, you have not failed. So the idea behind plan to fail is that if you plan to fail a lot, like if you just set out saying, I'm gonna try a bunch of stuff, this year, new things, I'm gonna try that thing I've been putting off, I'm gonna start that thing I was afraid to start. Um, and I know that I'll fail in the process, then you're probably gonna start more new things. Um, and you're probably less likely to quit because you already know that failure is a part of moving forward. All right, <clears throat> the second one, clinging to outcome versus one step or one day at a time. So the idea here is that, is the goal you're making is it an internal goal or is it an external goal? So if the goal is more focused on um, a number, so to speak, like on the scale, or, um, or a number like I'm going to make this much more money this year, or I'm going to um, do that thing somebody else wants me to do, those are external goals. Um, what I suggest is that you have kind of a vague idea of where you want to go, but you focus on the first step. So um, one way to do that is to try getting up in the morning and visualize the kind of day you want that day. It can be connected to big goals or it can just be connected to what you want that day, but you visualize it. And then if you have enough days that are like what you want, you're going to reach your goals. And I think that's a much gentler way to go about it. <clears throat> the third one, um, making unrealistic goals. So um, again, the idea, new year, new you, that's not very kind. Um, that's implying that you need to remake yourself. And I think that that's um, unrealistic and it's not kind. So the goals should be very doable. They should be within your values, not something that somebody else has told you to do and kind. The fourth one. I think this is probably the one that is the most common um, mistake that we stumble over, and that's using criticism, guilt, or shame to motivate yourself. <clears throat> so, um, I mean, I tell my clients all the time that nothing happens from shame, especially that shame just kind of makes everything slow down and stop. Um, criticism usually is not the way that people find themselves changing through criticism. They use it, they keep thinking that if they use it, um, they'll get there. And if they don't criticize themselves or talk harshly, um, that they'll just become a slacker. But the opposite is actually the truth. So I talk about the three C's of change being courage, curiosity, and compassion. So when you're talking to yourself about your goals or anything you wanna change or in improve or add, then you need to talk to yourself the way you would a friend. And I think with friends, you tend to be very curious and compassionate. And so catching yourself when you're um, talking about your vision or your goals and noticing the tone of voice, we do have a tone of voice inside our heads. I know most, probably a lot of you are therapists and all of this is very um, familiar, but let me tell you, I've been a therapist for 30 years and I still have to remind myself of these things. So I'm not gonna apologize too much about um, telling you things you've heard before. Hearing it and even teaching it to other clients and doing it are so different. 
So I will just tell you that that's a setup for failure, using criticism, guilt, or shame. Instead, um, use kindness and talk to yourself. Like, be just as curious about why you have a bad day as happy when you have a good day and uh, things will shift. You'll get, you'll get your goals. And then the last one, um, actually, before I get into the last one, I'm going to stop for a minute and just see if anybody would like to share any thoughts or questions at this point. Um, because this, this has taken us to kind of to another section of the talk. So just unmute yourself if you would like. And um, I would love to hear any questions, comments, reactions, things you relate to. Um, I guess I could say that really does open up a good point about being kind to yourself because I see a lot, especially growing up with the social media life and how it's advancing. I see a lot of people post stuff because I think they kind of are hard on themselves and they like want to post about it and just show that they're progressing. And sometimes I feel like they're not as kind to themselves. Like they show themselves before and they're upset. And then after they kind of say, this is where I am now. And I went through like a really deep time. And so that made a good point about being kind to yourself. And a lot of people I feel like need to know that moving forward into the new year. So um, you don't really go by Georgia, do you? Yeah, I actually go by Georgia Grace. Georgia Grace, right. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> At first I thought you were your grandmother and then I saw your image and went, and then we <laughs> I recognized you. Yes, I know. I think she, I thought she was supposed to take this too, but maybe she's just having difficulties. But yes, I'm glad I could join. <laughs> Good to see you, Georgia Grace. Yes, you too. <laughs> okay, any other comments or questions or reactions? Hi, Linda. Hi, who's talking? This is Henley. Thank you for hosting this webinar. Hey, Henley. Um, I wanted to say that I think um, in our culture, our society, I think that failure is something that is very much looked down upon. And speaking for myself, at least, I was raised with that mindset. And it took many years of therapy for me to see that not only is it, is it helpful, it's necessary in order to grow. So I appreciate you uh, bringing this to light because I feel like a lot of people haven't gotten to that uh, that mindset yet. So thank you for that. Thanks for saying that, Henley. And some of us, like I said before, we know the truth and we would tell anybody else that, but when we've been raised with that feeling that mistakes are fatal, it's still hard to sort of let it sink in. Anyone else? Okay, well, let's move on to the fifth reason. Um, and of course, these are just reasons I have um, stumbled across or, or whatever and put together. It's not, not necessarily there's only five or that these um, are the most important five, but they're the five that seem important to me right now. So the fifth one is having ambivalence about change. Are you really ready? So a lot of times in our, the forefront of our mind, we know what we want, we have a vision and we are ready to make the change. But in the back end of our mind, we have some fear or hesitancy about that. And oftentimes what's in the back end of our mind controls our behavior more than what's in the front end of our mind because it's a little more subconscious. And so um, if we haven't changed something yet, there's, there's usually a reason. I mean, we do make sense. Everything makes sense. We don't always have all the pieces of the puzzle and we might not realize we're making sense. In fact, we may feel crazy at times, but if you pause, and you pay attention to why change has been hard, then I think that, um, that that's just as important to pay attention to. So it, the, here's some of the ones that I go over with clients. Um, I have them on a list so that nobody will feel like criticized or accused if I bring it up. And I just ask, do you relate to any of these? So if I seem happy, others won't know that I've been hurt. If I become happier, too much will be expected of me. 
being happy or content will let somebody else off the hook, maybe somebody that hurt me. I do not know if y'all can hear this, but my cat is trying to dig into the room. If you don't mind, I'm just gonna open the door and let him in. Otherwise he's gonna distract me the whole time. I told you this would be casual. I'll be right back. Live theater, I love it. <laughs> I did hear something. I was like, I wonder what that is. <laughs> Gotta love the kitten. That reminds me of Gizmo. I know, right? <laughs> He's not here. <laughs> he's at home. Under my bed, whenever I'm doing anything on Zoom, and he's very quiet all day, but somehow he got stuck outside and he was mad. <laughs> okay. Um, being happy or content will let somebody else off the hook, like somebody who may have hurt, hurt me. If I seem happy, people won't take care of me. Um, if we didn't get our needs met, um, sufficiently and nobody does 100%, then many times we have this sort of in the back end of our mind, wish that somebody would take care of our, us, which is in direct opposition of um, moving forward sometimes, our goals to achieve something. If I become happier, I'll just be disappointed again. So these are a few, I have a, I have a list of more, um, but these are a few that I go over with people and just ask, it's just as important to explore this as it is to set goals. And um, I think then that brings it to the forefront of your mind so that then you can determine what your first step is with that, which of course is going to be your, I can't believe it. Now he's trying to climb up the chair. He never does this. He must not have an audience. You want to be in the show. I apologize. Let's move on. Well, wait a minute. First of all, anybody have any comments about any of that or thoughts or questions? Linda, I'd like to jump in. Um, my name's Tom. I'm Abby's uh, dad. Um, and I just wanted to kind of put a plug in for a book I'm listening to now. I'm, it seems relevant, so I'll share it. Um, it's Jen Ranchero's new book, uh, Badass Habits, which I got for Christmas. And it, for those people that know Jen, it's, it's pretty much right in her wheelhouse. And it kind of resonates with what we're doing now is, is one of the sections of the book is having this um, obsession to say yes to mm. people who ask us to do things or, and fear of, of, of saying no. And that's kind of related to being happy. You know, you get happiness from making people happy or saying yes or um, feeling safe when you do things for other people. Um, so that kind of dovetails into um, setting goals that you can achieve um, and also just developing good healthy habits in any any situation not just fitness or wellness but just dealing with people or family or anything like that so anyway I just put a little plug in there I think it's 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 current it's relevant to this discussion and I think Linda you're you're kind of dovetailing nicely with developing good habits, healthy habits, so that you're not ambivalent to change or fear of failing, things like that. Just wanted to share that. Thank you, Tom. That is such a great point. Somebody said to me once, every time you say yes to somebody else, make sure you're not saying no to you. If you can be saying yes to them and yes to you, then you're probably in good shape. Anything else anybody wants to share? I do always love seeing these kind of statements laid out. I feel like it's so helpful to put the words, like you were saying, it makes sense in your brain, but you might not even know that these sentences are true for you. And seeing them laid out, it's like, oh yeah, that is how I feel. And then you can kind of challenge that when it's written instead of trying to figure out what it is that you feel and then what to do. It's very helpful to have that guide. Thanks, yeah. I think it takes some of the um, sting out of it too. If you see it already written down, like I'm not the only one who feels that way. <clears throat> Anything else? Okay, then let's move on. So now, um, if you notice, uh, I mentioned a couple of times as I was going through this that um, it's like, um, 
these these things can hold you back from having a vision because of whatever the statement is. Um, if I seem happy, people won't take care of me, which implies ambivalence. Like I want to achieve that thing or move in that direction or start that hobby or whatever it is, but I have this fear. So there's two sides. One part of me feels this way and another part of me feels that way. So um, that is basically what ambivalence is when you feel two different things about the same thing. <clears throat> so um, ambivalence is very common. It's healthy. It's, it's good that we have ambivalence. It, it allows us to be creative. It allows us to see things from different perspectives, um, see uh, from different angles. And um, so it's very common. So it, just to um, kind of underline, underscore that thought, you can see all these different phrases we have for the experience of ambivalence. Of two minds, I'm torn, dilemma, the jury's out, waffling, etc. So it is very common. Um, some people get more stuck in ambivalence than others. And there's many factors. I've written about all the different factors that make some of us more vulnerable to getting stuck versus just moving through. But the actual experience of having ambivalence is um, a natural part of being human. <clears throat> oh. These are the factors, I forgot to put this slide in. <clears throat> Excuse me. The factors involved, so in developing severe ambivalence, again, ambivalence is common, but severe ambivalence, when you get stuck, that is a different thing. And so if you're a highly sensitive person, um, and most people who uh, go into therapy or counseling, and <laughs> including most counselors, um, and helpers are highly sensitive people and it's related to brain chemistry, but um, it causes you to feel things bigger and thus avoid fears with more vigor. I didn't even mean to rhyme, but I'm gonna remember that. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and then of course, whatever early experiences you have and then brain functioning as well. I mean, every um, neuro neuronal pathways uh, develop habits to conserve energy. So every time you repeat something, it's a step toward a habit, which means it goes further and further into the back of your mind, right? Less and less conscious and willful. I mean, if you think about getting into your car, you can make that car get on the road without even thinking about it. You can be lost in thought completely and be driving somewhat safely. Um, maybe not as safe as if you're totally mindful, but that's how automatic driving can become when you get in your car. Try getting into somebody else's car and you haven't developed that um, habit, that natural flow, and it's all very awkward. So that's the opposite of habit. Now you get in many times, then it becomes natural again and moves back to the back end of your mind, which is good. And whenever I say back end, I just mean subconscious, deeper areas of your mind and, and more of a, um, a, 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 um, not really in your brain. It's not back in your brain. It's back in your mind. That's the difference. In your brain, what the function is, is that that neuronal pathway has become um, thicker and thicker and faster and faster through physiology every time you repeat it. So there is brain functioning that is going to compete with any change. Does that make sense? Because it has learned to be this way. And then also, the higher arousal that you are experiencing when you learn something, the quicker it turns into habit, the quicker it becomes um, automatic. For instance, if you're walking through the woods and you see a bear, immediately your brain is going to just um, soak up and store everything about that experience. So you're going to remember where the bear was and you're going to um, remember everything else. Like even if there's a creek running, you're, that's gonna get stored and connected to that fear. Whereas if you're walking in the woods and you see some flowers growing, even if they're your very favorite kind, it's just not gonna get that kind of energy in your brain. And the next day you may not even be sure you can find them. So um, that's another force against trying something new. If you've learned things under stress, they're going to be very hard to change. And those are the very things that we try to change. So this is where compassion comes in whenever you're trying to change or do something new is understand you're working against several forces and some of them are purely physiology, physiological. Okay, so now I'm going to go through several 
expressions of ambivalence, kind of how ambivalence shows up in our lives. And before I do, I just wanna make sure there's not any other questions or thoughts so far um, about this or anything else that's come to mind. <clears throat> So I'm holding my breath to avoid change. It is amazing what we do to avoid change. Change isn't comfortable. <clears throat> um, nobody really likes it. Um, well, most, most, mostly we don't like it. Some, some change we do. And so if you ever find yourself avoiding or procrastinating, one thing to wonder is, are you ambivalent? You know, like <clears throat> I um, need to make a doctor's appointment and I keep postponing making the doctor's appointment. And I keep being critical of myself. Wow, you forgot that again. Why did you do that? Why haven't you called yet? If I pause, put aside the criti criti critical voice and pause and ask myself and with kindness and compassion, hmm, why haven't I made that appointment yet? I might find out that I have some ambivalence about it. So that's very, very important because then only then can I clear out whatever the obstacle is so I can move forward. So um, I was actually talking to somebody recently and this was the case. She needed to make an appointment and she kept putting it off. And when she finally paused and um, explored it, she had had a very close friend just go to the doctor within that year and got really bad news. And she actually was fearing the bad news, but it hadn't even come to the forefront of her mind that that was the reason she was procrastinating. But then that was enabled her to begin to um, determine what to do so she could move, move forward or to determine what she wanted to do. Here's the interesting thing. If you don't notice why you're ambivalent, you don't even realize that you have many options. So she had an option of just not making an appointment. And she had the option of making the appointment get, even though she was afraid. But if you don't pause, then you don't even know for sure which one you want because you're kind of being um, held back by something that you're not aware of. I hope that made sense. Not at me if that made sense, thank you. <laughs> okay, another one, denial. What if we don't change at all and something magical just happens? That sounds so crazy. Doesn't that just sound so crazy? And yet I experience it all the time in my life and other people's lives and people I counsel. This denial um, that we have to actually do any work or that we have to actually take that first step and that we can just wish that things would change is, is very strong and very common. So that is something that um, if you find yourself wanting to make a change and you just don't know why another thing you can ask yourself is there something i'm denying is there something i'm in denial of continuing that theme i love this little cartoon it's not denial if i've convinced myself it's true so i want to tell you a story um, i have two boys they're college age but when they were little the younger one was um playing in our yard and i was i was several feet away gardening and he was playing with another little boy and um all of a sudden I saw the other little boy fall down. And I was like, oh, but he popped back up. So I didn't, I just continued what I was doing. A couple of minutes later, he fell down again. And I was kind of puzzled, but I thought, well, there are lots of roots around that tree. He must be chirping. The third time he fell down again. This time I saw what, I, what had been there for me to see. And I was even looking at each time. And that is that my precious little boy was pushing him down. And I absolutely could not wrap my brain around that to be able to see what was really happening until, I mean, it basically slapped me in the face. I couldn't see it because I couldn't, I didn't, I was in denial that my little boy would do something like that, would bully another little boy. Um, of course, then I intervened, but I was, I, I paused, I became mindful at how many times I had to see that before I saw it. And I was really, it really, um, impressed me that 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 denial is a real force it's real and it can really distort your perception and so becoming mindful of that and trying to whenever you feel like you're not moving forward the way you want to just stopping and saying okay is there anything I could not I could I could be denying
All right, another expression is when you forget something, you'll notice these overlap. Um, because they're all just expressions of ambivalence, basically. Oh, and I realize I've got in psychotherapy, but um, because I usually give this talk to therapists, but this is just expressions of ambivalence in life. Um, so forgetting. Whenever you find yourself forgetting something, you may want to ask yourself, is there some part of me that didn't want to, that didn't want to do it, like didn't want to make that doctor's appointment. So you can't remember things like my birthday and plans for the week, but you memorize every episode of Family Guy. I think that we do remember what, what we want to remember. If we don't have some reason, until you get my age, then you have a reason. <laughs> um, but if, if you don't have some reason for forgetting, the things that are important to you do stay in your mind, pretty much. You know, that's just kind of pretty much true. So when you forget something, I think that to be self-aware, it'd be very helpful to say, is there something some part of me that didn't want to remember to do that. Like I, I know in counseling, a lot of times I see someone who forgot to do something that they, they said at the end of maybe the last session they wanted to do. And they said they forgot. And I always pause at that. Um, <clears throat> it's possible. We do, I mean, we do forget some things, but I feel like it's more probable that there was a reason. <clears throat> and then of course, black and white thinking. Um, despite appearances, there is a gray area. So whenever we have black and white thinking, that's a good time to pause because most things don't exist in extremes, such as I'm a failure. That's pretty black and white. When we, when we hear ourselves talking to ourselves that way, it could be that there's ambivalence going on. Like there's a part of me that wants that and a part of me doesn't. It's not that I'm not capable or that something's wrong with my brain. I'm stupid, I'm a failure. No, it's probably something that makes a lot more sense than that. And is even um, easier to deal with if you get to the heart of the matter. Black and white thinking, I'm trying to think of other examples. Anybody have any thoughts about that or any of these that I've presented yet? Okay, then we will just keep going. Perfectionism. Um, perfectionism is actually an expression of ambivalence because perfection, perfectionism is usually um, a reflection of a sense of um, low self-worth. So I don't think people will really like me for who I am. So at least they can, um, admire how much I do or how hard I try or how giving I am. Um, and at least I'll have that. So even though everybody craves on one hand being um, accepted for who they are, if you have so low self-worth, on the other hand, you feel like you'll only be accepted um, if you're perfectionistic or if you were raised that way um, or something like that, as Henley was saying. So um, some thoughts about perfectionism. Making mistakes is normal. We've already talked about that. Perfectionism is boring. I think that's kind of fascinating. Um, it took me a while to wrap my head around that one. You can make mistakes. Unperfect is my choice. I like the phrase, um, I am uh, wonderfully imperfect. I am perfectly imperfect. Um, also, I like the thought that people like me better if I'm a I never realized that. I'm a recovering perfectionist and I thought that people would be more drawn to me if I was perfect. So I had trouble admitting anything else, but that's not the truth. I mean, think about the people you're around. Who do you connect heart to heart with? Do you connect around perfectionism? I don't think so. You probably connect around shared experiences, shared hurts, um, the ability to be open and share mistakes. So um, perfectionism at the core is ambivalence. Uh, the way out then is recognizing that it's an unattainable goal and that there's a part of you that really craves something more important and to begin working on that part. All right, I'm gonna pause here because we're getting ready to go into the third phase of the 
talk and see if um, you have any questions or reactions at this point. Don't be shy, we're a pretty small group. You don't even have to turn on your video to talk. I love the perfectionistic piece. I think that's really, really awesome. I love the imperfect is my choice. That's really empowering and fun. And I'm always gonna remember the little blue person. He's cute. <laughs> um, another thing to bounce off the perfectionism, um, it kind of reminds me, there's this boy, he's about two years older than my younger brother. And they used to be really good friends. And then he went to middle school and then all of a sudden he stopped wanting to be friends with him, I guess, cause he thought he was way older, but he kind of holds himself at, I'm perfect. Like I'm involved in sports and I'm older than you. And in the car, we were actually talking about, um, there's probably some self low self worth behind that. Or maybe that he's just insecure about some things because he holds himself at a higher level. So that kind of made me think everyone needs to keep their perfectionism down low, <laughs> if you know what I mean. <laughs> Good. I do recognize that underneath perfectionism is usually some kind of pain. <clears throat> or unmet need. And, oh, sorry. Um, in, in my opinion and in my personal experience, I feel that perfection, perfectionism is very toxic because you're always reaching for this, for this literally unattainable goal. And when you just keep reaching and you can't get to that point, it just pushes you down further and further. So true. Yes, because you just end up feeling bad no matter how much you do. I have worked, I have worked with a couple of Olympic medaled um, champions who didn't feel good about themselves due to perfectionism. I mean, it just it doesn't matter what they achieved. Continue to feel bad about yourself if that's your motivation is perfectionism. Thanks, Henley. Anyone else? I'd like to jump in on the forgetting point. Uh, I, uh, I'm a well-known forgetter. And I actually was talking to my mom last night on the phone. She wants me to help put her Christmas tree away. And we were deciding whether it should be this Saturday or next Saturday. And I suggested next Saturday. And then I asked her to send me an email to remind me so I don't forget. And so I got to work on my concentration skills and maybe I'm a little ambivalent about what's all involved with that. But I, I just thought that that forgetting point, what's the real reason why I forget things other than lack of concentration or old age? It's just, um, well, age plays a role. Maybe something under there. Me, not you. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, <laughs> me too. <laughs> and um, and I, I could have overstated that a bit. Of course, if you have attention or concentration, um, challenges, then that will also play a role. But I just think it's always good to ask the question, am I ambivalent? It could that be part of it? <clears throat> Anything else? Okay. Well, you may have been curious about this slide since it's been hanging out here forever. I'm about to control your thoughts. What are you thinking about? So um, I wanna um, talk a little bit about priming. So what I just did was I primed you to think about French fries, right? Um, priming is where some, something happens in your environment that controls your thoughts. <clears throat> For instance, back in the seventies, um, McDonald's opened up um, drive-through windows and at that point, they trained their, uh, uh, what do you call those people? Drive-through window operators, <laughs> I'm sure there's another name. Anyway, they trained them to um, ask, would you like fries with that? 
and the number of sales of fries once they did that training went through the roof they made millions of dollars back then that might have been a billion now um because they used one phrase to control behavior one phrase they primed people to want french fries so um another so then research began to happen um they call it priming research there's been all kinds of studies one of my um favorite studies was <clears throat> that they put people in two different groups. And in one group, they gave them a list of five words and they were to make, the task was to make a sentence out of the five words. And then the other group, same thing, but the two groups had two different groups of words. The one group, which was the quote experimental group had five words that could easily put, be put together into a sentence that related to being old. The other group had five words that could easily be put to, together into a sentence that was something neutral, like weather. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> and, and the people thought that they were being timed as to how quickly they could put these words into a sentence, that that was the purpose of the research. But what actually happened is that they measured how long it took people to walk from the exam room to the exit door of the building. And they found in an overwhelming um, uh, response that the people who were given the five words related to being old walked more slowly than the people in the control group. I find that fascinating. They had no idea that their behavior was being controlled, that their mood was being controlled. That happens to us all the time. We are constantly being controlled by things outside of our awareness. There's only so much we can do about that. But what we could do is take the same principle and turn it and use it on ourselves for good. So let's um, talk a little bit about what that would look like. So this comes from a book by Clifton Mitchell um, called Priming, Programming the Mind for Habit Change and Success. He says the way that you prime yourself for success is through this concept of preferred dominant thoughts. I think he coined that term preferred dominant thoughts. And it's similar to an affirmation only it has very, very specific characteristics. So it has to be a positive action that is worded in the present tense and focuses on small changes that can be personally controlled. So instead, oh, oh, and he explains how the subconscious mind moves you in direction of words, not necessarily whole sentences or phrases. So for instance, if you say, I want to be less socially anxious, your brain, those words, that word anxious, socially anxious, triggers your brain to associations that connect with those words. So what is likely to happen when you say to yourself, I want to be less anything, is that you will remember the times when you've been less socially anxious. So you'll what it was going to pop into your mind is the times that you felt awkward socially. And that's not going to help. In fact, your brain basically is all about making associations. That's its primary function other than keeping you alive, telling you when you're hungry, all that sort of basic stuff. Beyond that, it's about making associations, habit. So like, for instance, you know, you start off with um, your first associations, your mom points at the chair and says chair. And you realize that that object associates with that word. That's what your brain is always trying to do. So instead of saying, I wanna be less socially anxious, you make it a positive action worded in present tense, not I will, but I am. And then you, um, and then you uh, <clears throat> focus on a small change. So for instance, I smile and make eye contact with others. When you say that to yourself, it is a goal, but when you put it in, it's a goal to do it more often. When you put it in that kind of language, then, <clears throat> then you, your brain will actually conjure for you um, associations to those words, smile and eye contact. And you have done that before. And so your brain is gonna sort of give you images and memories and feelings of times when you have done it. Your brain will follow the words and then you're much more likely to do something when it's worded that way. <clears throat> so those are called preferred dominant thoughts. And that is you priming yourself toward the change. So take a goal. You might want to do this right now. Take a goal that you have. 
and then take a piece of it and put it into a priming statement or a preferred dominant thought. I wonder if I'm just going to pause for a second, give you a minute, and then I wonder if anybody would try to um, share one. I can share one if we're ready. Um, I so I am a person who who stutters, and this really resonated with me because in the past, when I would get anxious about stuttering, and I would think so even subconsciously, oh, I'm about to stutter. I can't stutter, and then it was like a self fulfilling prophecy. I would stutter. It was it's very interesting seeing this concept. So the thought, the new thought that I put into my brain um, was I am a fluent speaker. I love the way I speak and I talk and I'm a confident speaker. So I appreciate this um, about kind of flipping it upside down and thinking about it in a positive way. I love that Henley and may I concur with your, your statement because you have um spoken in those ways today with us. Thank you. I appreciate that. And it's, it's taken, I don't know, 15 years of speech therapy, but thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> well, it's paid off. All right. Um, anybody else? <clears throat> so one of mine is, um, I admit my mistakes. It's hard for me to do, but I do do it. And so that's my way of working on that goal is to remind myself, I admit to making mistakes, I admit it. Anybody else? All right. So here are just some of my favorite, um, strategies. These come from both mindfulness and act um, writings. And this is where you use your mind to change the brain. So this is the, the these are the kinds of activities that help you um, rewire your brain from old habit to a new habit. So um, <clears throat> for instance, three minute mindfulness exercise. <clears throat> I wrote a blog that said, if you could change your mood in four minutes, would you? Guess what? A lot of people just won't. We just won't put four minutes on ourselves. It's so sad, but I relate to that. And this is just three minutes. So the idea is that um, sometime during the day, most days of the week, until this thing becomes new, you, I mean, becomes this new thing becomes automatic. You do a three minute mindfulness exercise where you just speak to yourself or visualize the thing that you want to change. Um, I actually practiced what I preached the other day. I was um, being a little short with one of my boys and he told me about it and I was really kind of sad. And um, so I spent a few days visualizing him coming up the steps and how I would greet him and, um, and how I would do it differently. And if I did need to talk to him about something, how I would do it differently. And honestly, I had been trying for a few days to just go, okay, 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 I'm sorry, I'm not going to do that anymore. And it wasn't changing. And when I paused and really put some time into it, it shifted. That's what your brain needs. It's like exercise for your brain. So that's an example of a three minute mindfulness exercise. I think I could guarantee you that if you visualize something for three minutes every day, for a while, it varies for what kind of task and how complicated the task is, but it will shift. Um, setting a daily intention is sort of like that. It's just when you wake up, first thing you do is sort of tell yourself what your primary intention is for that day. So it could be, um, I admit making mistakes today. And then you actually look for a chance to practice the thing that is hard to do, hard for you or new. Um, it might be that I'm gonna smile at everybody I see today. Um, or whatever, it can be any of those um, priming type statements, those preferred dominant thoughts. You can't just write it out on a piece of paper and think that's the end of it. It's going to take more brain power than that. Grounding statements are similar. It's sort of when you're feeling anxious, 
um, or you just wanna be more mindful for any reason, you stop and you ask yourself, what is the most reassuring thing I could say to myself right now? Say I'm, um, I'm frustrated with myself. Well, what is the most reassuring thing to get you regrounded so that you can be more positive about what you're working toward? <clears throat> this last, this next one, computer virus. So back in the 80s, I think it was maybe 90s. I hate to admit it was 80s, we'll go with 90s. There was this um, virus that went around a lot of people's computers and I actually got it. I forgot I got it, but somebody reminded me when I was, that's another story. Speaking of forgetting, um, this virus went around and people would, their, their screen would go black and then up would pop the words, you are, oh, what was it? It was like, you are a big idiot. And that's all you could do. You couldn't do anything until you pressed okay. If you typed in okay, your screen, your whole computer went back to normal. And um, I guess somebody figured that out and then started sending it out to everybody and everybody was able to fix their computers. What a frustrating situation. You are a big idiot. Um, yeah, so I was telling this in a workshop one time and somebody came up to me, my partner, Rick Kilmer came up to me and he said, Lynn, that happened to you, don't you remember? And I was like, I, I read about it again later. I was like, I really don't remember that happening and, until he told me. Um, but anyway, um, so the idea, let me get to the point. The idea is that you're gonna have these thoughts. If you have old critical thoughts, they're gonna come up in your head. They're gonna pop in your head anyway. And you can let them affect you. You can keep them in the back end of your mind and kind of ignore them, or you can just go, okay. Sometimes that's the easiest way to move forward. Sometimes it's even quicker than, um, it's kind of like just turning your back on it. Maybe even quicker than trying to use affirmations and things. So um, that is also um, an okay way to change your brain because it gives it less air time. If you say, okay, it says you're a big idiot or whatever yours says, and you go, okay, and I admit my mistakes. You know, and you just give, you just switch then to the next thought that is more in line with your values and goals. Then, um, then you're moving, you're moving forward. And then this last one, We have time, so I'm going to ask you to do it. Um, you will need to stand up. If you want to turn off your um, screen, that's fine, but you can also just move out of the way. And this is actually comes from ACT. Um, this is an ACT. It is based on an ACT. An, an ACT is um, acceptance and commitment therapy. It's approach of psychotherapy. Um, and it's based on one of their strategies, only I added to it, I'm asking you to act it out rather than just um, think it out. So this now combines using your mind and your body to change your brain, which increases actually the power of the strategy. So what I'd like for you to do is if you can think about one of your thoughts that gets in your way, a critical thought, um, perfectionistic thought, whatever kind of thought it might be, and just let yourself think about it for a second. And don't push it away this time, actually let it come and notice how it makes you feel. You might even feel it in your body. You might notice how it makes you sort of stand your posture. And then imagine that you can just sort of turn to your right, turn your back on it. And just notice how that feels. Literally turning your back on the thought. Notice how that feels. Then imagine you can turn back and um, kind of take a step to the right and then look back at your thought. Look at where you were standing a second ago. Notice what you might want to say to it from a wiser part of you. And then notice how that feels. You might notice if that affects in it, the way you feel in your body, how you stand. And 
Then I want you to imagine that one of your, someone close to you steps into that spot and now they're thinking what you had been thinking. Notice how you feel for them. Imagine that they, they believe this thing. And then imagine what you might want to say to them and what, how could you encourage them or speak truth to them? What would you wish for them? And then imagine that they leave and you step back into that spot and take in your own wisdom. Hear yourself say what you said to the other person. Let that be your truth as well. Okay, that's it. Uh, you can sit down. <laughs> Any reactions or thoughts? I thought that was so cool. Um, my thought was, I'm not as good a bass player as I want to be. And so I turned my back to that thought. And then I stepped to the right. And I saw Abby there saying that to me. And I was thinking, she would never say that to me. Why would I say that to myself? And it was a nice way to diffuse that thought. I thought that was really cool. Thanks, Tom. It was part Anyone else? I have this keychain on my keys, and it was what popped up for me when I was giving my advice. And it says, You're exactly where you need to be. And I was like, oh, look at that universe, way to go. <laughs> so that felt really good. <laughs> That's a great phrase. Anyone else? We're about out of time anyway. Um, I do this with individual clients. I do it also in groups. I think it's a great um, exercise to do with teens or any other kinds of groups that you might work with. It can be really powerful because if you do it in a group, people are in a circle and then they literally somebody does step into the spot, um, which is oftentimes really powerful. All right, so we're about to wrap it up. Oh no, I thought I was, I have one more. Um, one more slide, the window of opportunity journaling. The idea here is that you use these prompts whenever you're about to engage in a behavior that's not in line with your goal. And I'm not gonna spend time on it because I'm out of time, but um, uh, I mean, you could definitely email me and I'd send this to you if you wanted or, or this, it's in my workbook. So I'm gonna do a shameless commercial real quick. Um, I have two workbooks. One is um, Understanding and Resolving Ambivalence. And it's, it, um, I have the book for clinicians and then this is the self-help book. And then I also have a self-help book, um, I'm Not Good Enough, How the Stories You Tell Yourself Are Ruining Your Life. So you can email me um, up there at www.lindapopbuchanan.com if you're interested in that or, or for any other reason, if you'd like to connect. So it's really been my pleasure. Thank you, Abby. Happy birthday to Clarity. Um, we have like one or two more minutes if anybody wants to hop in and ask a question or say anything and then then we're done thank you it was a great workshop <laughs> thank you georgia grace i'm so glad you were here what a <laughs> one you have there <laughs> thank you she said it was great too <laughs> <laughs> We're getting some thank yous in the chat box. Oh, good. Thank you. Awesome. Well, thank you so, so much, Linda. This was so amazing. We've got thank yous from Patricia, Corey, Karen Henley, Tatiana, and Dr. Dave Jensen. 
So thank you from all of them. And I am so, so grateful to have you. Thanks for everyone for popping on for Clarity's first birthday party. We had an awesome talk today. This is a great way to start the day, a great way to start the year. And we're so excited to continue to bring information like this to the Clarity community. We're also gonna be posting this webinar without any, um, well, we didn't do a, a full long Q and A, but if anyone has any questions to close out with, I'm happy to cut those out and keep confidentiality in this space. Uh, but this will be on our YouTube page, Clarity Fitness on YouTube, and you can share it with clients or touch back on it if there's something that you wanna revisit for yourself. And again, check out Clarity Fitness at clarityfitness.com. We offer all things body positive, all things eating disorder informed, personal training, group exercise, community groups, activities, webinars like this one. So we're super excited to be one years old today and can't wait to see what 2021 has in store for everybody. So thank you again. And if there are any final questions, the mic is yours. <laughs> For anyone who has anything. Well, thank you again, Linda. You're the best. It's always a pleasure to have you and have an amazing day. Okay. Bye, everybody. Nice Bye. Bye, everybody. Nice to meet you, Tom. Nice to meet you, Linda. Take care. <laughs>